Um, so the Middle East Institute is happy to welcome Dr. Elspeth Thompson. Um, she will present a talk on, called Inti Integration of Electricity Networks, the Middle East, North Africa, and ASEAN Regions Compared. Um, originally from Canada, Dr. Thompson has lived in Singapore since 2000. Uh, since 2008, she has been a senior fellow at the Energy Studies Institute at the National University of Singapore. In 2013, she became head of the Energy Studies Institute Environment Division. She received her PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Her research interests span Asian energy security, Asian energy economics, and energy and the environment. Besides her book, which traces tracing the history of China's coal industry and several edited collections, she has published numerous articles and book chapters on many aspects of various types of energy consumed and traded in Southeast, North, and South Asia. Through the 90s, she taught at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver and Lingnan University in Hong Kong. From 2001 to 2007, she was a research fellow at the East Asian Institute at NUS, where she was a China energy specialist. And as of December 2014, Elspeth became a research affiliate of the Middle East Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Well, here we are. Um, this is the outline or the roadmap for this talk. Um, what can be gained from integration? And then first looking at ASEAN, and then Middle East, North Africa, mm -hmm. and then some common obstacles for the two regions, and what I'm calling changing goalposts, climate change, renewables, fracking and LNG, nuclear power, cybersecurity, and some conclusions. Uh, it's a small group today. It's cozy, that's great, and I, I know most of you, so this should be fun. Um, most of my guys on this part of the floor are from uh, the Energy Studies Institute, and uh, maybe they'll be asking me the, the tougher questions about electricity networks and pricing and all that stuff. And, but I'm going to try to talk more to the Middle East Institute people who likely don't know much about uh, electricity or power networks, and hopefully the twain will meet. There's a, there's a bit of interference again. Just put it, oh, sorry. Put it OK, so I'll just project. Oh, OK, I'll talk into this one. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, now, uh, before I begin, most of the information that I have here is, is based on what I've written in the past. I've, I've written various chapters for various books um, which talk about the ASEAN, uh, electricity network plans. Um, and also lately at ESI, we've had quite a bit new, a bit new activity. Um, this is the program for an event that was held in November. Um, ESI is working with uh, Chula Longhorn University. Um, there's quite a bit of momentum in the ASEAN region towards uh, integration of the grids. And on the Middle East side, um, I happened to find this report on the web um, that was written by the World Bank. And uh, it's, it's a mine, it's a gold, golden uh, source of information. Uh, everything you'd want to know about the plans uh, in that part of the world and the problems. And if anybody wants to take a look at that uh, later, they can. I've circulated this. This is, this is taken from this report. Um, You'll find that I've got many more slides on ASEAN than I do the Middle East, uh, simply because I wasn't quite sure about copyright issues for the Middle East. For ASEAN, it's sort of my, my territory, so I felt comfortable. Um, but don't tell anybody that I photocopied that. And, uh, but I think that you need something to hold in your hand so you can see how the bits fit. OK, uh, what can be gained from integration? This is your basic boilerplate stuff. The, these these uh, technical gains are known um, no matter whether you're talking about Latin America or the Nordic region, whatever. Um, if you've got a large region and separate power grids, why would you want to try to tie them up? Here are the reasons. 
um, to facilitate cross-border power purchases and exchanges. Some parts of this big region are going to have surplus electricity. Some parts are not going to have enough electricity. And it's a useful thing to balance it out, to share that electricity. Within a large region, you're going to find areas where there's tremendous seasonal and daily demand for power. You know, uh, there's, there's climatic differences. There's differences in consumption. In some areas, there's huge industries which are operating 24 hours a day. In other parts, there's going to be peaks in the day. Um, you know, when people come home and at night, everyone's switching on their electric kettle and their oven and um, lights, and et cetera. Uh, improve system security, reliability, and efficiency. A larger network tends to be all of these. Reduce reserve margins. That means you don't have to have extra capacity, a lot of extra capacity for those sudden peaks uh, because it's available within the neighborhood. Uh, improve load factors and creative, uh, greater reactive power support. Um, again, scale is useful. Uh, instead of having a small grid, having several grids tied together uh, generally has advantages. From a socio-political perspective, there's also good reasons. For countries of diverse backgrounds, you need to sit down and talk. In this little cartoon thing here, I've got the pieces of the puzzle actually fitting together. Um, I'm going to use this, this puzzle theme again um, in the talk. People have to sit down and actually solve these issues, like energy data reportage. You can't have your, your data in different units um, and not being able to speak to one another. You've got to have the data that meshes together so you can make easy comparisons. Um, and it seems a fairly innocuous way to start talking about energy production and consumption, imports, exports, stockpiles, prices, CO2 emissions. It's, it's, um, it's basic stuff, and you have to get everybody measuring all of these things the same way. <coughs> and for countries uh, that have been war-torn, that have not been communicating well for any reason, you know, this is, this is a good place to start. It's, it's often scientists or social scientists who, who don't have anything at stake really apart from getting the job done. Um, and it, it can be, you can use this to build on further discussions. So it also fosters the transfer of, of knowledge and skills and information. And this is an opportunity for a far more efficient provision of electricity. In both these regions in ASEAN and the Middle East, they don't have to make the same mistakes that Europe did or North America did. Um, Europe and North America were, were very clumsy when they started to integrate their networks. Um, they were you know, going, feeling, tapping in the blind, um, trying to get things to work. But there's a lot of experience globally now in this. There's logistics gains. You know, in the uh, Industrial Revolution in China, they've been developing their economies on coal. Filthy stuff. Filthy, filthy stuff. It seems absolutely ancient now to be to consider using coal. And indeed, uh, I don't know if you guys have been following the, the climate change discussions and uh, what happened in, in Paris. There's a big push now to, to stop using all of these fossil fuels. And oil, of course, this, this cartoon is a seal clinging to a rock in an, in an oil spill. You know, surely, surely we can get beyond this. Um, and generate electricity cleanly and transmit it over the wires instead of putting it on trains um, or ships which are liable to catastrophe, you know, environmental catastrophes of one kind or another. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, the gains or the, the reasons for integrating networks fall into three categories, security of supply, which means basically ensuring that everybody has enough power to do what they want to do. Competition, uh, that, mean, that means um, an arrangement which makes business sense. You know, somebody's going to make money, 
but not you know, ridiculous profits, but it's going to be self-sustaining from a financial point of view. And then the final one, sustainability, I put in green, that obviously means environmentally friendly. Um, the EU's grid interconnection work has been focused on competition. The, uh, you know, the European countries are, are old. They've been around for a long time and they're relatively stable, at least in Western Europe. And um, it's imperative that whatever arrangement is, is developed, that it, that it not lose money. Um, not often easy to, to, to reach this point. And I'll uh, get into that further later. For East Asia, Latin America, and parts of the Arab world, they're focused on the security of supply. Um, there's a lot of problems. Um, people not having enough electricity when they want it. Uh, mind you, there's an awful lot of wastage in the Arab world. Going back to Europe, it's sort of the initial benchmark for all of this. Following World War II, Jean Monnet, who was a famous diplomat and a political economist, he believed it was necessary to create institutions which would serve the interests of all European countries. You know, Europe was flattened after the war, and um, energy was a, was a critical issue. Um, he believed it was necessary to achieve tangible results in a few industrialized sectors before attempting to realize ambitious plans for economic, social, and cultural union. Um, the war had, had, had separated people and uh, caused a lot of distrust, obviously. That's what wars do. And uh, he felt that, well, everybody needs energy. And at that time, they were using a lot of coal. So among the things that he did was uh, establish the European coal and steel community, and also scrap metal. Not very glamorous stuff, <laughs> but it's, it's so crucial. You know, when you, when you stick something in the wall in an outlet over there, there's, you, you think it as being rather a clinical operation, but the, the energy in the raw form is kind of yucky and grungy. Anyway, launch of an electricity grid in 1956. And uh, here we are today. Um, there's tremendous interconnections in Europe and still many more planned um, to even out the grid. And if we look at the world as a whole, there are several examples of, of where this is being done. Central American Electric Interconnection System, Southeast Europe, Pennsylvania, Jersey, mainland, and something called the Nordell, which includes Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, established in 63. And it's made connections with Germany, the Netherlands, Russia, and Estonia. All right, let's talk about ASEAN. ASEAN uh, first started with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, three countries, Philippines, Malaysia, and Thailand. And then 67 was the formal inauguration so it expanded to include Indonesia and Singapore. Then 80, in 1984, Brunei joined. In 1995, Vietnam. 1997, Laos and Myanmar. And in 1999, Cambodia. For a total of 10, which is what we have today. And these countries, although they're fairly close together geographically, there have been a lot of problems. Um, and they're not, those problems have largely healed, but they're still undercurrents and there's new problems. The Vietnam War, you know, can you imagine 20 years? I was in my teens in the 1970s, and every evening when we turned on the news, we saw the Vietnam War. It was on the news every single night. Sort of like the situation in the Middle East right now. And not only was there, you know, the death and the killing, um, it, it split people. You know, the people who were living on the other side of the world, they took sides. Um, you know, some people would be very pro this action and some people would be very against it. It polarized American politics. 
and I'm not American, as, as she said, I'm, I'm originally from Canada, but we had thousands of draft dodgers coming into Canada. And, you know, Canadians were split over. Should we let all of these young men into Canada without any papers or not? There was the drug problem. You know, a lot of the young men uh, got hopelessly addicted on drugs during the Vietnam War. So I'm just giving you examples of, you know, war is a nasty, nasty thing. And uh, it has, uh, besides the death and killing, there's, there's many ramifications which go on for a long time. Uh, within ASEAN, there was the Laotian Civil War, also about 20 years, the Cambodia Civil War. and these were kind of connected and also harken back to um, colonialism, you know, the French um, time in these, in these areas. The Cambodian Vietnam, Vietnamese War, 77 to 91. And today in Myanmar, uh, we have terrible things going on. You've probably read in the news about the Rohingya Muslims in Rakhine. Um, you've got thousands of people living in camps as we speak with no future and no easy solution, right? I'm trying to, I'm, I'm bringing out all of this for you so that you people from the Middle East, because you probably don't know that much about the ASEAN region, I'm hoping that you can relate to what has happened in ASEAN. Um, and you, we can see that there's, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of comparability. Myanmar is, is basically several groupings of minorities, peoples, and they do not get along. <laughs> I suppose that the dominant group is Buddhist, um, but there's around the perimeter of the country, there's all of these minority groups, and very, very difficult to see how they're going to resolve any of the problems. Thailand, uh, as we speak, governed by a military junta. Um, you know, people are still going to Pattaya, on tourism jaunts and people are still flying into Bangkok and life goes on, but the king is going to die any time and this, this could be kind of unsettling. Um, in the southern part of the country is um, insurgency and likewise in the Philippines. Um, some instability, to put it mildly. ASEAN today, okay, originally they were going to sit down and talk with each other every uh, five years and then they made it three years and then since 2000, one, they decided to meet every year, and then since 2008, twice a year. So this is, this is a good sign for ASEAN, you know. They're actually getting together in the same room and um, agreeing on an agenda. I've got a, a picture of, of the dancers there. You know, I don't want to be cynical, and one mustn't be cynical, but these gatherings in the past, they, they tended to be rather light, you know. They, they, want, they avoided getting into the deep discussions uh, they smiled for the cameras, and um, just this 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 uh, this month, um, the ASEAN Economic Community they they've been building up to this climax. Um, whether they've met their goals is another question. That's you, in the press you'll read uh, some coverage which which is you know so positive. Yes, we've come a long way, and um, we're doing fine. But uh, you'll also read um, some commentary saying got a long way to go yet for these countries to actually solve any problems. Um, so political cohesion problems, um, often it's military versus rule of law. Uh, Cambodia and Malaysia both held elections in 2013, but they can't really be called democratic. And you know, if you ask yourself in ASEAN if there really is any democratic country there, um, now, don't get me wrong. Um, sometimes too much democracy can be problem problematic. You don't get anything solved if if uh, people are allowed to voice their opinions uh, too freely. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, somebody has to make a decision and, and go with it. Within ASEAN, we also have the South China Sea disputes. Um, involves Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, basically over some rocks in the ocean. And um, what are they fighting over? Well, what are they disputing over? Potentially large energy resources under these rocks and sea lanes. Um, the handling of the haze issues is an example. I think most of you will have been in Singapore um, 
in, in September when it was not very pleasant to walk around because of the fires burning in Indonesia. And, you know, finger pointing instead of solving it. And it's, you know, this has been going on for several years now. Economic cohesion problems, uh, non-tariff barriers, limited transparency, limited trade and service. Notice for this little cartoon thing, I've got the, the pieces of the puzzle, they're not fitting together. The pieces of the puzzle are there and, and they're overlapping a bit, but the problems are not getting solved. And I'm getting towards the end of the ASEAN uh, discussion. The so-called ASEAN way, compromise, consensus, and consultation. This is the way that the ASEAN countries agreed to uh, meet on those grounds and, and to arrive at decisions. Some people uphold it still, and, and some people are, you know, they kind of laugh at it. This quote here is by uh, Rod Severino, who was Secretary General of, the, of ASEAN. And he, uh, he said this in, in 2001. I'm not sure he'd say the same thing right now. Actually, I, I did a book on ASEAN with Rod, and um, he's, you know, he's, he's completely realistic um, about ASEAN's problems. Um, but with a hindsight of history, we can say that this aspect of the ASEAN way has served Southeast Asia well by not forcing its incredibly diverse and mutually suspicious members into legally binding standards. ASEAN has done the remarkable job of moving its members from animosity to the close cooperative relationship that they enjoy today, a relationship in which violent conflict is all but unthinkable. We can say that the ASEAN way has served ASEAN well well, like I say, there's a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily ag agree with that. All right, now look at looking at the ASEAN situation. There's still an awful lot of people in ASEAN who do not have electricity. And I've, I just pulled out some examples. Um, Indonesia, 66% electrification rate. Uh, this is rural areas only. In the cities, um, most people do have power but 49 million people in Indonesia alone who do not have any electricity. Cambodia, 10 million. Myanmar, 36 million. Philippines, 21 million. You know, that's an awful lot of people. And this impacts health. It impacts education. And it impacts investors looking in and wondering how they can get involved. You know, electricity is sort of fundamental. Um, and who, who's, who should spend the money on this? Should the governments try to find the money themselves? Should it all be um, in the form of development aid? You know, big question. Anyway, um, ASEAN is going to have among the highest electricity demand over the next 20 years. And so people who are in the energy industry um, are all very carefully looking at this area and watching it um, <coughs> to see who's going to step in and um, you know make some big moves. Heavy use of coal. Uh, now this is not good in terms of climate change and greenhouse gases. And very wasteful use of energy generally. Now there's there's two initiatives which uh, go back some years. The ASEAN Power Grid which was formally mandated in 97, although it was discussed uh, way, way before that. Six of the 16 interconnections have been built. And these are primarily what are called point to point. Um, that means just from point A to point B with not necessarily any plans to, to branch out. These are the ones that which have been regarded as most economically uh, feasible. Varying technical standards, absent legal and regulatory frameworks, diverse governance and institutional structures, power tariffs that don't reflect costs, private investment investment is coy. You know? it's, uh, there's no great incentive to get in there from a business point of view. This is a map, um, a rather old one, but it gives you the idea of uh, what is envisaged. Another major drawback for the ASEAN area 
although it's fairly tight geographically, Indonesia is a huge country, an archipelago. You know, you've got thousands of islands. And it's, it's, um, it's technically feasible to, to do submarine cables and to connect islands which are very close one way or another. Uh, but it, it's easier if you've got a flat land, la land mass. All right, let's switch over to the Middle East. Um, I chose this map because it's multicolored, and each of these these countries are different. You know, they're they've got different economic systems, different uh, cultural. You know, they have some cultural um, homogeneity, but not completely. Um, they're a very different bunch, and to get these countries to talk to one another, uh, in this is it's it's not easy. Although I was interested in, the, in this map that they actually included. Um, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Chad, and Sudan, which are not typically included in the, in the definition of the Middle East or MENA, are they? Oh, not Niger. Or yeah, Sudan. I would have thought so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was surprised to see because uh, that's not what I would have chosen. Okay, well, if within this region, there are three main grids uh, which have been operating for some time. Um, the Maghreb Regional Interconnection, which is Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. And it da actually dates back from the 1950s. Morocco was connected to Spain in the late 1990s. And Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia are now all synchronized with the pan-European high-voltage transmission network. Another grouping is this uh, EIJ LLPST. Uh, which is Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Libya, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Turkey. It was Egypt who got the ball rolling in 1988, and now they're in the process of integrating with Turkey, with the grids in Europe, with a full view to uh, joining with, with this group. And then there's the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is very small geographical area, and it's very simple to string up the lines among these countries. Uh, this was begun in 2009. But uh, within the, the many of the countries, they're finding that their gas production is insufficient. You know, we all tend to think that, wow, the Middle East has got tons of oil and gas, and how could they possibly have shortages? But this is what's happening um, largely because of poor planning. They have not been developing capacity at a sufficiently rapid rate. That means, you know, preparing the ground to get the stuff out of the ground. Um, and there's also been really uh, horrendous wastage of electricity. Uh, I hear stories of people in certain countries going on vacation for three weeks and leaving their air cons running. <gasps> um, and why does this happen? Because of pricing issues, um, subsidization issues. Um, there's not a huge incentives for people to conserve energy. Okay. Okay. For the other two regions, um, interconnections have existed for some time, but there's not much transferal of power due to limited reserve margins and no common regulatory framework and institutional weaknesses. So you've got two power grids, or you've got you know small power grids, fairly close together, but they're not joined. And on some, some times within the 24 hour of the day, you've, you've got surplus in this area and, and deficit here, and maybe you've got surplus here and deficit here, and you should be evening it out so that there's no disruptions in power Now there's, there's huge differences among the three existing sub-regional interconnections in the, in the way that they operate. Uh, here's a snapshot of uh, some of the um, electrific electrification rates in the rural areas again. Um, I looked at all of the, the figures for the Middle East and for North Africa, and generally speaking, um, in the urban and the rural areas, it's, it's over 97%. So this is a bit different from ASEAN, uh, where you don't have 
millions of people, millions and millions of people without any power. Within the Middle East region, Yemen was the lowest, 32% electrification rate and 13.3 million, and Syria, 84% and 1.6 million. Now, of course, we all know that um, there's terrible things going on, going on in parts of the Middle East right now, and in any war, often it's the power which is knocked out first. You know, In uh, World War II, um, the Japanese tried to wipe out um, or the, any refineries, any superficial en energy infrastructure, um, the, the players in the theaters, basic in the, in the various theaters of World War II, they tried to wipe out the energy infrastructure. And this is happening today as we speak. If you want to bring a country to its knees, you knock out the power and also the water. Um, but as I, as I pointed out on, on that map earlier, when I, I wondered about those countries in below Morocco and Algeria and Egypt, that uh, are typically considered part of Middle East MENA region. Um, I did find these very, very low figures for it, like Mali, 9% electrification, Mauritania, 2%, Niger, 4%, Chad, 1%, Sudan, 21%. Uh, these countries are directly below the region in question that I'm looking at. So um, it's not very comforting to know that your neighbors barely have any power. Right. So eventually, um, the plan is, the, the, the long-term vision is for the three Arab sub-regional markets to merge into one, and also to connect with the EU and the rest of Africa, and possibly Asia. Now th this, this would be a huge geographical area to connect. And one thing about electricity power lines, um, the energy does dissipate with distance, and so you, you can't have long, long, long cords. You, you have to have substations in between um, to help regulate and balance, synchronize. All right, now here we get into the comparison bit um, and the commonality. Let, let's, let's look at the common features to start with, and maybe in the discussion we can look at differences. So. ASEAN's 10 countries and the Middle East, North Africa is 22, at least for the purposes of this World Bank report, uh, they were examining 22 countries. Very, very different stages of development, huge differences in land area, population, GDP per capita, and electricity consumption. And many of the full countries, they really don't want to talk to their neighbors because they're fully occupied looking at their own problems, whether it's war, or just sheer poverty. Um, they're, they're focused on getting through each day. <laughs> and it's, it's not easy to, to push them to the table and, and to talk about this kind of issue, but uh, you know, it's, it's time. Many of the country's individual power development has taken, a place, taken place in silos. You, like, it's evolved separately. They have not when they were building the initial uh, power transmission equipment, they were not thinking about what their neighbors were doing. That was the last thing on their mind. And so now is the time to, to look at those differences and, and see how, if they can be connected from a technical point of view. And generally speaking, the technical issues are not the problem. It's very much the political problems. Some countries are, are on a trajectory of very rapid reform. Other countries are not. Various governments have uh, different motivations and financial capabilities and different levels of openness to the private sector. Some countries are more Marxist central planning. Other countries are, are more capitalist, um, open laissez-faire. A big issue is for many governments is they just don't know exactly what the benefits will be in, in monetary terms or in practical terms even. So they're, they're hesitant. Another big concern is if one country has an awful lot of power, they don't want to be told by anybody that you, they have to sell it to their neighbor. You know, They certainly don't want to be told by countries outside to sell their power to their immediate neighbors. Why would they? They're concerned that they're going to be forced to sell to their poor neighbors at a very low price. 
and they're not going to make any money. So private in investment is coy. It's difficult to, to build attractive business cases for this. Subsidies are a real bugbear. When some countries are selling the electricity at the real price, that means covering costs, and other countries are pumping in money to, to offer it to the population at a low price because the population is so poor, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to stop those subsidies and find another way of supplying electricity to the poorest of the poor when they, they, they simply can't afford it. They don't have money. But there are, there are ways of, of, of handling this, actually. In some of the countries, corruption is still quite rampant. Uh, money is made in the electricity sector, whether it's the coal industry, or the gas industry, and, and it just disappears. It goes poof, and people don't know where it's gone because it's been siphoned off. Um, but uh, with transparency and, and when countries come together, you, you can't hide. There's no place to hide after a while. It'll all come to light. And of course, the hostilities. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Myanmar, where, where people are literally killing each other. Now, on top of these obstacles, in the last decade, and even less, there are other things which have made the integration of power networks even more complicated. Now, my guys over here know that when I started my energy research in the late 70s, early 80s. There wasn't a anything such as climate change or emissions. <laughs> we were not, that wasn't on the agenda at all. Um, but it's very much at the top of the agenda now when you talk about energy. Um, the world wants to evolve away from fossil fuels because there's real concerns that we are all suffering, especially the poorest of the poor from climate change. Um, you know, the small island states with rising sea levels, increased storm activity, that kind of thing, which the scientific community is attributing to the man-made uh, use of, of uh, fossil fuels. Um, there's another school of thought which says that this is a cyclical thing. If you look at the planet, you know, from millions of years back, you'll, and you look at the, the layers of the ice, you can see that, oh yes, it was warm during this century and it was cold during that century. But be it as it may, whatever, whatever you believe, um, we're definitely getting warmer. That is definitely a fact. The cause is debatable. Um, just about a week ago, the climate change negotiations were concluded in Paris. As I said, there's a big push for the world to drastically reduce the use of fossil fuels. And what do you, you know, if, if in the Middle East, the Middle East is known for, for having the, the hugest deposits of, of oil and gas, and they've, they've, their whole economies revolve around these industries. What if, what if there's, they're forced to stop selling the stuff? Um, that's gonna, not gonna happen overnight, for sure. Um, but I'm sure that there are many governments in the, in the Middle East and other countries around the world whose economies are based on fossil fuels. Where they, uh, they're somewhat disconcerted. Certainly before the Paris meeting started, um, there was a big camp campaign on to disinvest from the coal industry. Um, you know, the, the, this has huge ramifications on global finance. Measuring carbon emissions. Uh, Many countries have not started, really, to, to measure their carbon emissions. But for regions like ASEAN, the Middle East, North Africa, who are talking about integrating their electricity networks, this is going to be a big thing. The carbon emissions from the various sources of energy, the sort of equipment that they use, which will minimize the emissions. So that's one changing goalpost. Another changing goalpost is renewables. And this is related to the, the previous one, climate change. If you're not going to be using fossil fuels, that means that you've got to be using these renewables. So that means solar, wind, biofuels, geothermal, etc., <coughs> which look very, very exciting. They have tremendous 
potential but there's a lot of technical issues to resolve what happens when the wind doesn't blow what happens when it's cloudy already in germany and other places where they've uh, gone into the renewables in a big way uh, households individual households are setting up their own equipment and they want to feed any excess power that they have into the grid well this is really mucking things up the, the, the infrastructure that was set up decades ago was not set up to handle all of this extra power coming in. Um, smart grids are designed, are being designed to, to handle this, but there's, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things to be ironed out before they operate efficiently and smoothly. Um, in preparing for this uh, seminar, I've, I've tried to bone up on the Middle East, North Africa situation as much as I can. And I can see that there's uh, tremendous uh, hope. People are rubbing their hands gingerly thinking, wow, Middle East is hot, lots of sun. That must mean lots of solar power. But other people are saying, well, there's sand and it tends to blow onto the solar panels, uh, which is not good because it, it could actually damage the equipment. But there is a vision um, for massive uh, solar panels being installed in North Africa and sending power to Europe. Um, maybe, maybe this will come to be. And there's massive plans for uh, within the Middle East region uh, for solar power to substitute to replace for a lot of the gases that, that's being consumed. And uh, there's a lot of people on the ground in the Middle East now who are, who are trying to um, sell solar panels and, and get it going. Uh, but it, it'll take some time. Another changing uh, aspect of energy globally is fracking and LNG. Fracking is, is what we've heard about so much in the United States where um, equipment is, is sent quite deep into the ground and it, it vibrates and it, it releases trapped gas. Hitherto, this gas was known about, the energy experts knew about it, but they didn't have any way of getting it out. They have a way of getting it out now, so that means that there's, there's much, much more gas available in the United States and developing in other parts of the world. Uh, it completely changes the, the gas map on the world. Um, the United States had been importing a lot, and now it's going to be exporting. Uh, also, another thing related to gas is there used to be only pipelines. Now there's LNG. You see those funny ships with the big balloon-looking things? LNG uh, can be put on these special tankers and can be sent anywhere around the world, very reliably, very efficiently. Singapore itself has built its first LNG terminal and is planning another one. And all along the east coast of China, there's a whole bunch of these new terminals. Middle East is also getting into these. It, it, it changes the configuration of energy consumption drastically. Another ha thing that's happening in the energy world is, is uh, a certain resurgence, question mark, following Fukushima. Immediately following Fukushima, uh, governments were thinking, you know, we'll, we'll put a hold on our plans for nuclear power. We won't even go there at all. But now, um, you know, a certain amount of time has passed, and the general consensus is that the nuclear power equipment in Japan worked just fine. What happened was a natural disaster in combination with some cultural issues in Japan, the way they responded to it. But the actual equipment worked fine. It worked the way it was supposed to. So what we're seeing is that the, a, a lot of discussions are happening now about uh, nuclear power in the Middle East. You know, Saudi Arabia is planning 16 nuclear power plants. And I nearly fell off my chair when I read that. Um, China has got a whole bunch of plans. China is already into nuclear power in a big way. India has many plans. 
within our neighborhood here in ASEAN, Indonesia is still talking about it, Vietnam. You know, these, these, these ideas are, are popping up and um, taken rather seriously. Obviously, we have not solved the problem of what to do with nuclear wastes. Um, that one's just sort of put on the back burner. But the advantage of nuclear power is relatively clean. Although it's expensive to build, once you get them up and going, the power is quite cheap. Um, there are issues with whether or not there's enough labor to run these things. Um, because nuclear power was, was sort of um, shut off for a few decades and, and most universities stopped teaching students about nuclear power, but these are being resuscitated very rapidly. Okay, and I think the final goal post here uh, is cybersecurity. The power sector is actually among the most targeted of cyber attacks. As I said, if you want to bring a country to its knees, you infiltrate its power system. And most governments actually are rather ill-prepared. Singapore is, is very rapidly getting up to speed in this, the United States, Europe. But the smaller countries who are still struggling to feed themselves, uh, to build hospitals and that kind of thing, you know, this is, <laughs> it's way down on the list of their priorities, but it's, it's scary. Now this is, this is something that is important if you've got integrated electricity grids because th there could be a domino effect. If you manage to, to break down into one, if you, if, you, if you shut down one power grid, are there going to be the, the breaks, the, uh, the modular uh, configuration which, which will prevent a domino uh, collapse from happening? I don't know. And one of the most worrying things is, it's not actually people sitting at their computers um, who are allowing bugs to get into their systems. It's the mobile phones, you know? You may, because often people are communicating with all of these computers and it's, you know, it's all connected. Uh, just somebody making a mistake uh, uh, with their, with a mobile phone, sharing information incorrectly, it's, it's, it's allowed its passage for someone. Okay, conclusions, here we are at the end. Um, this has not been a technical talk um, because I knew that the Middle East people, it might be kind of new, all of this to them. Um, within this World Bank report, uh, here's a quote, review of global experience is most revealing in the sense there is no evidence to suggest that any of the existing or developing regional integration schemes got the model right at the initial stage of integration, right? But the positives of trying to do it are many. There's so many advantages. There is no one size fits all. It's important for these regions to understand how the process worked elsewhere in the world. You know, they need to go to Europe and meet with Europeans to see what mistakes were made, what mistakes can be prevented. Go to the other regions where these things are being grown up from the ground it's important to have a can-do attitude. It's so easy to be cynical and thinking, oh, why bother? It's, it's simply not gonna happen and we're doing okay as we are um, and the war, of course. But I would argue that getting scientifics, the scientific community together to talk about some of the technical issues first is where you gotta start. So uh, the ASEAN and Middle East North African regions will do well to examine each other's progress as well as the key problems in lack in, that are still lacking resolution. They've got a lot of common ground. And I think that's it. There we go.